Now we're moving to treatment methods and specific techniques for treating CAS. And I need to start by reminding you that there's no single management procedure, no single program, no single method that's most appropriate for childhood apraxia of speech. We know, and we've discussed a number of these, that there are a number of principles in the literature that are typically accepted as being most important for treating childhood apraxia. We know that uh, treatment often in, falls into four different categories. Uh, articulatory, tactile gestural, prosodic, and augmentative devices. Uh, we're, <clears throat> we're not gonna be talking about augmentative communication today. Uh, in the larger on-site workshops, we often uh, get into discussions about when, if ever, augmentative communication is important. And of course, it's important for most kids early on that don't yet have enough verbal communication to make their needs and wants known. In that case, naturalistic gesture, sign language, and simple methods of augmentative communication can be very helpful while the child is early in therapy until they have enough speech uh, to where augmentative communication isn't needed anymore. That, however, is a whole nother workshop, and we won't have time today to discuss that. We will be discussing articulatory, tactile gestural, and prosodic methods. Again, keep in mind that a method is just a set of stimuli, I mean, a set of cueing uh, that's very prescribed, um, or in some cases prescribed to a degree, and it doesn't involve the real clinical work of therapy, which is making all those clinical decisions. Also remember that most therapy approaches or methods are going to involve a combination of all three perspectives. Certainly all involve articulatory work because that's, after all, what we're doing is speech therapy. Most will bring in at least some prosodic elements, even those that are tactile or gestural based or uh, more integral stimulation based. And the important thing is that you make all your clinical decisions based on these principles of motor learning. So in terms of articulatory approaches, the first thing that <clears throat> comes to mind usually is this idea of integral stimulation. This is basically what we've been doing in speech therapy for the last, I don't know, 50 years or more, where you have the, the client, patient, child watch you, listen to you, do what you do. So we would bring the child in and we say, okay, we're gonna work on speech or movement, however you wanna say it. I'm gonna say it, you say it, and if you have trouble, I'm gonna help you. It involves direct imitation, emphasizing both the auditory and the visual model. Um, we have emphasized in this course that having a child with childhood apraxia of speech watch your face is very facilitative. And for young children or children with attention deficits, this can be a problem initially, and we have to actually work through progressive approximation, if you will, and positive reinforcement to develop that skill. Many people always ask me if I use a mirror in therapy because then the child can get visual attention. If they don't wanna watch me, maybe they'll watch themselves in the mirror. <clears throat> well, the mirror is a tricky thing. I have a mirror. I use it occasionally, but I keep it in the cupboard. For the most part, I don't use it with children that have apraxia of speech because often they're watching their own wrong movements or they're playing or playing or whatever, and we're not spending our time efficiently. On the other hand, maybe I'm trying to get an initial articulatory configuration or placement where I'll bring the mirror out just as a novelty, make your lips do this, where they're watching me and themselves. If it doesn't help right away, I go ahead and put it back and we'll use a different phonetic placement technique, like a straw, just to get lip rounding. Move the straw, have them stay there. One, and go right into the speech act. So sometimes we use a mirror to facilitate phonetic placement, but mostly I'm not using the mirror. Now, as I said, sometimes we have to actually begin therapy by building the prerequisites for doing an integral stimulation approach of any type. Uh, we might have to work with the parents to teach them ways to facilitate and reinforce attention to the person's face, either the parent or me. 
um, <clears throat> as well as general imitation skills. And we talked about that earlier in the video. These are really prerequisites for any integral stimulation approach. And with most children, we've been able to, uh, to get the children to be able to look at us and imitate uh, within a week or two if we really make that our initial goal. The major technique we'll be talking about this afternoon is an integral stimulation approach or based on integral stimulation. It's called dynamic temporal and tactile cueing or DTTC. Um, DTTC is uh, an approach that I developed over a number of years because the methods that I was using weren't very efficient. Some of them were effective, but it was just taking way too long to get the results, and kids were getting frustrated. These were mostly the more severe children, and mostly children that had CAS. Um, so it was designed and it's most appropriate for these children with uh, severe CAS. The prerequisites for use of DTTC with the child is that the child has to be able to focus attention to the clinician's face for at least a short period of time. I have used this technique successfully with kids that could only look at me for under, say, around five seconds, and that would be it. And we built from that, and very quickly, and I'll show you some methods for that later uh, with some video. Um, the children, in order to uh, use DTTC, the children also have to be able to at least attempt direct imitation. They don't have to be able to do it correctly, but they have to watch me and try because then I can work to shape their movement by first providing maximum cues and then fading those cues. The best candidates for DTTC are children with severe speech deficits, primarily due to childhood apraxia, able to focus attention for at least a few minutes at a time, able to attempt direct imitation, and have good access to therapy with good parental support and participation. You may not get that last one. I mean, sometimes the real world just doesn't allow us to have the very best situation. But I think it's also important to know what are those things that allow the best chance for the most efficient therapy. And, and this would be the case. Remember that DTTC and many of these speech treatments are not appropriate. If the child is somewhere on the spectrum and does not yet have joint attention, does not yet have the intent to communicate, cannot use any gestural communication or even point to what they want, then you're not at a place where you're ready to do speech therapy. You're going to begin by gaining that joint attention and intent to communicate. DTTC would also not be appropriate if the child's cognitive level is just too low for them to volitionally attempt to vary parameters of movement, maintain attention, or even understand what's going on in the session. So those would be two situations where DTTC really wouldn't be appropriate. Now, <clears throat> DTTC is an articulatory method of treatment. It's based on integral stimulation and emphasizes the shaping of more accurate movement gestures for speech production. It builds in continued practice of those gestures in the context of speech. Um, it's really based on a technique that was originally used for adults in a praxy of speech uh, called the eight-step continuum that was uh, written about in Journal of Speech and Hearing Disorders in the 70s by Jay Rosenbeck. And at the time, I was working in a hospital setting. I saw both kids and adults, inpatients, outpatients. And I was working with a number of apractic adults at the time where I wasn't making much progress. And I read this article by Jay Rosenbeck and was amazed at the difference <laughs> in the response to treatment. So after beating myself up for not knowing anything like we all do in speech pathology, I implemented Jay's techniques and found, boy, I was really making a lot more progress. So I decided to use this with the kids that I was seeing that seemed to have some of these same deficits in processing. And I was very gung-ho about it and went in and we started it. And I had to amend the hierarchy somewhat because it was a hierarchy based on temporal relationship between the stimulus and response. So uh, it started with simultaneous production, direct imitation, 
He would say it, they would say it. Repetition after a delay. But then they would read a card and there were other steps that just weren't appropriate for the kids. So I did the first few steps, um, first several steps to the delay. And it just wasn't working. And I couldn't figure out why for the longest time. <laughs> and then I realized adults had a lot of experience talking. They knew what running speech felt like in their mouth. They had a specific lesion that affected part of this motor planning and programming uh, problem. And even though they might be quite severe in a proxy of speech, these techniques work quite well, much better than they were working for the kids. So it occurred to me that maybe this use of a hierarchy similar to, to Jay's would work if I um, added and faded the cues more frequently rather than reaching a criteria at simultaneous, moving to direct imitation until they reached a criteria, moving to the next step. In this case, in DTTC, um, it developed to the point where we would add cues, fade them as soon as we could, and then add them back in if they faltered. And that seemed to work much better. So the treatment evolved uh, from there. Remember now that changing this focus of treatment to movement versus the phoneme changes everything. It changes how we choose stimuli, how we organize that practice, how we use the principles of motor learning. And these clinical decisions that we've been talking about were very important to the whole um, design of DTTC as it evolved in that I wanted to bring in ways of implementing principles of motor learning as we implemented DTTC with children. Over time, I learned that if I got better at this, it greatly influenced not just the efficacy, but also the efficiency with therapy. So integral to the method, as I mentioned, is this use of a hierarchy of temporal delay. So what happens is this, in my view, allows the child to take increasing responsibility for the assembly, the retrieving, and the executing of motor plans with progressively less cueing. So I always say we want to think about what is it that we're trying to do. Well, we're trying to make the motor planning and programming more of uh, efficient so that they'll be more accurate. But we also have to think about the fact that we also want to make it less difficult for them by increasing the automaticity of it. So there's a lot of things that we think about as we implement motor learning principles and as we organize practice and provide feedback that allow us to do what we think we're trying to do, which is to get the child to take increasing responsibility, that is learning, generalizing the accuracy of these movement gestures for speech. So the rationale for DTTC comes from an important assumption uh, regarding the nature of the impairment in CAS, which is that the primary deficit is that of motor planning, specifying those movement parameters for volitional speech production, which leads to the conclusion that we have to have the child watching us and having the intent to be more accurate in their movement for the gesture for that syllable. And as I said earlier, this is actually a paradigmatic shift from what we typically think about in, tr in improving speech sound production. Being clear about this goal of intervention is important, and that we're clear about this goal with the child, in words they can understand, and with the parent. So when designing DTTC, um, if you think in terms of the World Health Organization um, uh, models in terms of activity and impairment and participation, we want to think about the fact that we can focus on the impairment first, but we can't forget about how they're going to be accurate in activity as they're producing speech first in the session and then in carryover activities, but also then being able to carry that out at, by initiating more speech at home and at school and at church or wherever the child goes. Many of these kids have such a difficult uh, early beginning <laughs> with speech that they learn to rely on other kids, on signing, 
on gesture and are hesitant to initiate speech, even when they've made so much improvement that, that it would be easy for them to do that. Now, this doesn't happen with all kids, but I've had it happen with enough children that I think about it now. And for those kids, we try to give them lots of practice in real context as early as we can. So in general, DTTC does incorporate this whole idea of starting with maximum cueing and then fading those cues as soon as we can, but bringing back, back in a level of cueing if they flounder a bit and then fading it again. So you're always adding or fading cues depending on the most recent response the child gave you. <clears throat> so let's go over the DTTC hierarchy or procedures. So simultaneous production is the first one. However, I want to tell you that in practice, I usually start with immediate repetition. I say it, they say it. Because I've told them, if you have trouble, I'm going to help you. So I don't really want to start helping them. I want to let them try first. And sometimes they surprise me. <laughs> so I say it, they say it. Typically, they won't be able to say it yet. So then I say, OK, we're going to do it again. I'm going to help you. We're going to go really slowly, and we're going to say it together at the same time. Now, a lot of times, we'll have to kind of introduce this concept of simultaneous production before we even begin therapy, because it's weird. Whoever does that? Nobody ever does that. So I'll say, we have a, a trick in therapy, a tool that we use, and it's talking at the same time. And sometimes we'll use it. Let's practice that. Can you say, hmm, let's do it together? Because that's continuing and easy, and you can cue it. We're going to do it at the same time. One, two, three, go. Mm, and they get that idea. And then you do ma, and then you do mom, just so that they get the idea. So immediate repetition, if they have any difficulty, you say, OK, we're going to do it together now. Do it with me. Mom. I'm using a gesture, and they're doing it slower and simultaneous with me. If they still have trouble, I'll use a tactile cue on the child. And you're going to see this in videos in just a little bit. Once they are able to produce it at the simultaneous level, um, then we gradually start increasing rate toward normal. So with each repetition, once they get close to <laughs> accurate, we'll be moving toward natural, normal rate. And when they can do it at natural and normal rate and they're accurate, I start varying my prosody. So I might say, Let's do it together. And we've said, mom, mom. I was able to uh, fade the tactile cue. Mom, mom. Fade the gestural cue. Mom, 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 mom. I'm getting more toward natural rate. Remember, they're doing it with me simultaneously. And all of a sudden, I'm going to start going, mom, mom, mom. Mom, mom, where well, I'm mixing up my prosody. Now, we're doing this at the same time. They don't know what I'm going to do, and I don't expect them to do what I do. But I want them to change it up in some way, and they usually start to do it. I don't worry if they don't, but I want to give them this idea. When we get to direct imitation, then we require it. So once they're accurate, normal rate, we vary the prosody a bit, I'm going to feel confident in fading the cues when we go to immediate repetition. So I'll say, oh, now I'm going to say it, and then you say it. I'd say, mom, mom. Even though we've just done it simultaneously a whole bunch of times, it's not unusual for a child to miss the first time they do it at direct imitation. So we've added another step to the program, which if they falter, instead of going all the way back to simultaneous, which you could, the idea is always add or fade cues. We might go back to simultaneous, but usually I'll say, I'm going to say it, and then you say it, but I might move my lips. You watch me. Mom. And I will add a mime while the child repeats the word. That mime should be fairly slow. Mom. And the child, nine times out of ten, will be able to do it with that mime. So we stay there for a few productions. When I feel like they're more stable, I'm going to fade the mime by just going to the initial configuration silently. Mom, while they say mom. So that you can see I'm just getting them started. And finally, I'll fade that. Mom, 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 
mom. When they're accurate, we've got to normal rate. I'm going to start varying the prosody. Now I want them to. Mom, and they'll go, mom. Say, no, try to say it like me. Mom, mom, mom. And then they'll, if you sort of use different emotion, then they get more into it. Mom, and they'll start varying the prosody. Remember, this is bringing in that principle of variability where we have to, ch the child has to change the motor planning requirements even though it's the same articulatory target. So after immediate repetition, when they've reached normal rate, normal, ac if they're accurate, they've reached normal rate, they've varied the prosody, we're ready to go to the next step in the hierarchy, which is to add a delay. So I might say, Mom, you wait, you wait till I point to you or touch you, whatever works for that child. I'll say it first, but you have to wait. Mom, go. And then they say, Mom. The same thing often happens, where even though they've just done it in the immediate context, when I add the delay, they may falter, bring in the mime again. Or sometimes you go back to direct imitation. Occasionally, you might have to go all the way back to simultaneous just a few repetitions, and you go through the hierarchy again, but only it comes very quickly at that point. And then finally, they're going to be doing spontaneous production. So by the time you get to the delay, you're going to start using shorter blocks because they're getting pretty accurate. Remember, we have to fade the blocks as well and fade the number of trials per session because we want to get to more random, right? Because we're moving from mass or blocked practice to random. <clears throat> so at this point, we're, um, we're, we've gone to some smaller blocks, and we've gotten fewer responses per block. And now we're just now and then asking a question. So maybe you're working on a different stimulus, whatever that might be. Maybe it's me too. And then you'd ask, who do you say hi to when you come in from school? <gasps> Mom. Or and then later, you have practice a few more. And who makes your bed for you? If you know, you got to find these things out. Who usually cooks dinner at your house? Although no, more and more dads are doing it. So that one doesn't work as good as it used to. Um, uh, who drives you to school? Whatever the might, that might be. Who washes your clothes? Um, but just sort of figure out who does what in their house before you do that. And then when they're really good at spontaneous production, that is, they're getting it almost every time spontaneously, plus you're keeping your probe data and they've reached a certain criteria, then mom goes out of your training list and a new one comes in to join the group. Now the rationale for this hierarchy is that it does just what I think we want to do in improving this movement accuracy to improve the efficiency of the specification of the movement parameters. We're providing maximum support at first, and then uh, we're slowing things down. We're emphasizing the proprioceptive input. We're going slow enough and simultaneous enough to get more accurate movement, and then we're fading that support at each level of the hierarchy as quickly as we can to facilitate motor learning. So just to review, therapist models the utterance, child repeats. If that's good, you just keep at the direct imitation level. If not, you go to slower, simultaneous production. At that point, especially with kids that have more severe impairment, you may have to use tactile cues, gestural cues, sometimes even phonetic placement techniques that we're all used to using. Uh, and we may want to really work on uh, proprioceptive processing by having him or her hold that initial articulatory configuration longer and then going more slowly through the movement transition. Um, <clears throat> so you're at direct imitation. If the child's unsuccessful, move to simultaneous production, where we're going to say the word slowly with the child. We'll use articulatory placement if we have to. When the child does achieve that spatial target, especially for the initial configuration, have them stay there, let go, and then see if they can get back again. Now, there's another strategy that I built into DTC that isn't part of the, um, the hierarchy, in, in a sense, but it's an extra cue that can be very helpful. So let's say you picked uh, a stimulus item that makes sense in terms of its vowel content and makes sense in terms of uh, it's a very functional word. So maybe it's baby. Maybe they just had a new baby in the family. You're working on the vowel AE anyway. Um, and 
they're just having trouble. They just can't get to that configuration. And if they do, it's hard for them to get the A into the final clo uh, lip closure again. What we do, rather than say, well, you, well, you can say, oh, I made a mistake. This was too hard. Most of the time, though, you're not going to make a mistake. You're looking at your motor speech exam results. You're choosing your syllable shapes and vowel content very specifically. So here's another thing you can do. Rather than just throw it away and bring in a new one, first, I would suggest making the motor planning requ requirement easier. And one way to do that? is take out a lot of the specification requirements. So let's take out all the respiratory muscles and all the laryngeal muscles and just make the movement. So let's say it's baby. I'll tell the child, boy, this is a hard one. Let's try something different. Let's not talk. Let's just move. Let me see you move. Good. Let me see you move your mouth. All right. Now we're going to move for baby. Watch me do it. I might exaggerate a little bit, but not a whole lot. Um, now let's do it together very slowly. Get ready with me. And you want to, we don't go, or, or we go for baby. 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 Only oh, I'm going to do it without voice. That often it takes a while, but if you do it real slow, and you'll see an example of that in just a few minutes as well. You take the voice out completely. You're simplifying the motor plan because they only have to do the oral articulators. Then slowly, when they get accurate and fairly normal rate, you can bring in a whisper. Baby, baby, baby. And then finally, a little more voice. Baby, baby. I've, I've found that to be very, very uh, helpful and typically don't have to make different decisions about choice of stimuli. Okay, when the child achieves no struggle or groping, good accuracy, normal rate, and was able to vary the prosody just a little bit, then we go um, back to direct imitation. So we've gone from simultaneous to direct imitation, add the mime. So we're just reviewing this again. You continue then to follow this temporal hierarchy of simultaneous direct imitation, adding the delay. And within each one, you're constantly adding and fading cues, building to more normal rate, varying the prosody. Within each word, you're also moving to shorter, less frequent blocks. So they get a little less practice until finally you're just randomly eliciting a spontaneous production by asking a question. And you have to do that for a couple of sessions before you feel confident of it going into your generalization activities and bringing in a new training item. All right, so I've been talking through this. Um, so we're on slide 160 and we're just going through the hierarchy. On slide 161, you'll see references for uh, treatment efficacy uh, papers that have been published on DTTC. So now we're going to uh, change gears a little bit and play a video of some treatment examples. You're going to see uh, several children. And what we're going to do is play the video for one child completely, and then we'll pause it, and I'll make some comments about the therapy you saw in that uh, segment. And we'll do the same for each of the segments that you'll see. The next segments will show some examples of therapy with children who have childhood apraxia of speech. This clip shows an early treatment session in which I'm looking for appropriate items for him to practice. At this point, I'm paying attention to how much cueing he needs rather than carrying out the therapy strategies for improving his speech. At this point, I reward him for any tries, letting him know it's okay to make mistakes. I also reward him for certain movements, such as the lip rounding for the W, even though he still distorts the vowel. Try. No way. No. A. Good job. Can you tell me 
When? When? <laughs> try when. It's okay if you can't do it right. I just want to see you try. Good trying. I'm going to do it with you. When? Good one. My turn. When? Good for you. In this last clip, you noticed how much difficulty this child had with the initial articulatory configuration for the rounded lips for the W. When he watched me do it, he was able to quickly and fairly easily reach that initial articulatory configuration. This is an example of how important it is to have the child watching your face as it's very facilitative. This clip shows a therapy strategy in which the clinician and the child say the word or phrase at the same time. Notice how he does better when he looks at the clinician. After he is fairly accurate, we move to imitation. This is harder for him, so we can either go back to saying the word together, or, as you'll see in this clip, have him repeat the word while watching me mouth the word at the same time. Gestures and slowed rate are other cues used in this clip. Notice how slowly we move toward normal rate with continued practice. No way. No way. No. Good job, very good. Do you like to eat dirt? Oh, way. You're trying, that was very good. Say, no way. No, no way. way. Good job. Do you like it when people pick on you? No, no way. way. One of the things I think is important to do in DTTC because it's so repetitive and rote drill is that every now and then we have to throw a question in there or a comment to help the child remember that this is real speech that's going to be used for a real person, a uh, real personal reason. Uh, so for no way, that was something that was easy for him, but we really chose it because he had so much trouble getting to that initial configuration for the W in any context. Um, I wanted to bring in the fact that what might he really use that term for? And so, do you like to eat dirt? No way. Do you like it when your mom reprimands you? No way. Where you're just reminding him, there's a real use for using this, and I think we really do need to do that uh, now and then. So I'm not really getting out of the where I am in the hierarchy, because as you noted, he tried to respond, and then I'd say it simultaneously with him. So I'm just throwing that in now and then to remind them this is real language. In this next clip, we see the same child a couple of days later where we are working to vary the rate and rhythm so that speech becomes more natural and more automatic. In this clip, we also see a therapy strategy of adding a delay before he imitates so that he is less reliant on cues. Note the large number of responses that are obtained. This is an essential key to motor learning. Way. No. Way. No 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 way. Okay, let's see if you can wait. No way. No way. Good. No way. No way. Good. I was mouthing it. That helped you, huh? No way. No, no way. Yeah. Could you put your hand down, buddy, so I can see what you're doing with that mouth? Thank you. No way. No way. Good job. No way. No way. That looks real brown for O. No, no way. way. Good one. My turn. No way. Nah. <laughs> Do it again. No way. 
job. I didn't help you at all. In that clip, uh, you saw an example of the delayed context, and you saw how he faltered more, even though he had done it quite well, even varying the prosody in direct imitation. And I hope that you also noticed, in the delayed context, he could be correct, although at a slightly slower rate, but he stopped varying the prosody. At this point in time, he can't really handle the programming demands of both. With continued practice at the delayed level, we will have more success at varying the prosody. I wouldn't move on to more spo to spontaneous production until he was able to easily vary prosody in the delayed condition. Now we'll watch just a little more of this child. Let's try a different one. Tell me, I'm home. I home. I? I. This time we're saying I'm, because we want to say I am home. I'm, I'm home. home. Make those lips round. I'm. At this point, you will see him start to go on automatic pilot, where he's just repeating, but not really thinking about what he's doing. At this point, we need him to slow down and bring back his focused attention. Okay. Let's go. That very good. In this clip, the child is asked to attempt a phrase that is newer and harder for him. I need to bring back his attention to my face so he can benefit from the visual cues. We often have the child stay in an initial position for the first sound a little longer to help him get a better yeah, feel for it. As much. So we're going to do something here. Stand up. Put your hands like this next to me. Eyes up here. Get your lips ready. We're going to go. Just leave him there. Good job. Stay there. Why not? Very good. Let's just say why a few times. You ready? Why? Good. Why? We're just not wine, honey. Why? Finish with the E. Why? Good. Why? It's really interesting because you say I really good, but why is a lot harder, huh? Why? Good. We're just gonna say why. I'm gonna show you one thing. I want you to open your mouth a little bit. Good. Don't smile. Just go. Why? Then smile. Good. Why? Good. Let's do it again. Why? Yeah. See if you sit way up here and watch me, we get better. Okay, watch it. Why? Why? Good. Why? Why? Does mom ever say? Cause I said so. When you ask her why, how do you sign why? You have a sign for, yeah, very good. Now you can say it, huh? Why? Good. Let's do it faster. Why? 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 You're starting nice and round. Why? Why? All right, let's try it. Why? Good job. You can rest your mouth. Go like this. Yeah. Now go. Why not? Why not? In that last clip, you noticed that he was starting off rolling all over the couch and really having a hard time attending. This wasn't typical for him unless we were doing something he knew was new or that would be very difficult. He had had a lot of trouble with this particular syllable shape and, and phonetic content. Uh, so he was a little anxious, I think, about this session. It's interesting to me how simple, novel things can bring the child right back without much effort. Just asking him to stand up and put his hands on mine, there's nothing special about that at all, except that it gave him something to do, brought him back, it was novel, so he's kind of interested again. And it sort of took his mind off the fact that this is difficult. I also went right to simultaneous, and that gave him a little more support, which allowed him uh, to continue. The other thing that I'm often asked about when I'm showing clips of therapy is the kids might be on a couch, they might be slouched a little bit. Um, sometimes I have the kids do therapy standing up and we, make, we take steps across the room as we're doing repetitive uh, practice. 
Um, and I'm often asked, why don't you have them sit at the table and, and attend and, you know, have their hands so that they're not moving around? And I have a lot of feelings about this. One is that I'm spending a lot of time having them sit at the table and keep their hands on this instead of both of us focusing on the goal of the treatment. The other reason is, you know, kids talk when they're slouching on the couch. Rarely do kids talk when they're sitting in a chair with their hands like this. So I like to make it a little more ecologically valid, if you will. Now, if they're all over and they're not looking at me like he was at the beginning of this session, then we have to bring them back to us. But I don't mind, personally, if they're sitting on a couch or even slouching. Now, in full disclosure, not everyone agrees with that. And so you'll have to use your clinical thinking and work, what, work in a way that works best for you and the child uh, that you're working with at a certain time. Let's look at a different clip of the same child. Although this child can say the I vowel in some words like by, he has more trouble in more complicated words like bike. This is common in childhood apraxia. Note that we never separate sounds within a syllable, such as b, ike, because movements for a single sound are different than the movement for that sound in a oh, syllable. Yeah. My bike. My bike. Oh, that was a good my. We need to do i in bike too. I want to see your child move. Bike. bike. Let's do bike five times. Bike. 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 Good. Bike. Back. Oh, back. I'm hearing kind of bark. Let's try I. I. Bike. 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 That was it. Bike. Bike. Good one. Bike. bike. Do you have a bike? No. Yeah. Yeah. I thought you got a bike for your birthday. You Did you forget? You probably didn't get to bring it with you, did you, to Rochester. So that'll be fun when you go home. You can ride your... Bike. Bike? I don't know what that is. You want to ride your... Bike. Better. Good job. Logan, what would you like to ride? You like to ride your... Bike. Good. You have a red... Bike. Did I remember that right? Is yeah. your bike red? Good. You have a red... Bike. Can you fix that? I bet you can. I bet you can. Think about it. My bike. Oh, you're going to say my bike this time. We can just say bike for a while. Bike. 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 You have a red bike. bike. Good. Whose bike is it? Mine. Bike. Good job. Whose bike is it? My, My bike. bike. Good job. In that little clip, you saw a sample of, we're still in direct imitation, but I'm bringing in more language. I'm bringing in more questions. Logan, uh, and I have his mom's permission to use his name, uh, Logan was one of the kids that was very, um, making very rapid progress, but was loath to s try to use speech. I think he didn't trust it or trust himself. And he would resort back to using his signs or gestures. And so I was worried about this and started to bring in a lot more kind of language use of whatever we were using. I find I have to do this to varying degrees. Some kids just start using them right away. Logan uh, was, had, he really didn't have any functional verbal communication until he was almost six years old. So for him, it took uh, a lot of extra work like that. So even though we were in direct imitation, I was doing sentence completion for the work, for the word by itself. I was bringing in questions. And sometimes uh, we really need to do that. In this next clip, you'll see a child with severe childhood apraxia of speech who has much more difficulty paying attention. You'll see him sitting on my desk, which I really like to do with the little children so that their face is equal to, in height, to mine, and it makes it much easier for them to look at me rather than when they have to look up. It also allows me to use his favorite reinforcement, which was to look at a cartoon on the video monitor. Um, we had to start with this child with about uh, 
one uh, repetition of practice to about 10 seconds of video, and then we can move on to two and to three repetitions. And within about a week, and again, we saw him twice a day for half an hour as part of our dosage study, um, <clears throat> we were able to get him up to about 10 responses fairly, fairly quickly. So I'll just play this tape, and then we'll make a few more comments uh, at the end. This is a child who needs more rewards for practicing. He is very motivated by watching a favorite character on the video. We give him short video breaks after each period of practice. This keeps his attention to our face. Over time, we can increase the amount of practice trials between the video breaks. Notice that we over-exaggerate the movements at first. This is sometimes necessary for children with more severe apraxia. We work to quickly refine the movement as they become more accurate. Who can say out, 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 almost out. That was it, James can. Who can say um, out, out, that's it, that's it. Yeah, you knew you didn't quite out. have the vowel. Yeah, out. Good one. Out. Good job. Out. 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 Can you look right here at Edie? Look at Edie so we can do it three times. Home. Good job. You made your lips round. Home. Good job. Mommy, is it? We'll watch more in just a minute. Let's do three more. No. Uh, two more? Okay. How about two and two? Okay? Okay. Home. Good job. Home. Home. Good one. Home. Good job. Home. Good. Lips around. Home. Slower. As you noticed in this last clip, we are over exaggerating a bit to keep him with us and to get him just moving his mouth, which he was having a hard time doing. The more we practice, the more we try to refine the movements. In this cl last clip that you see, I really should have slowed the movement sooner than I did and probably started refining the amount of jaw opening a little sooner as well. The next clip you'll see is a child who is a bit older, who has been in a, a therapy just a little bit longer, and who has uh, now achieved uh, a place in stimuli where he's doing longer utterances. Um, I'll just play the clip and we'll make a few comments after. This sample shows a child trying a word that seems too difficult at this point in therapy, but I reluctantly included it because he really wanted to say it. He was accurate within one session and proved me wrong. We look at you. Yeah, right here, buddy. Yes. Oh, good hugs. Okay. Watch how he smiles. We're going to do it together. We're going to say wonderful. Wonderful. Good job. Let's do it slower. Can we go Hi. real slow? Because it helps. Look at Edie, please. Oh, what am I doing? I want to do something different. Let's take let's take the voice away, and we're just gonna make some movements. Let's get the yeah. stickers like that. Yeah, just like we did before. We just make movements. No talking. Let's just do this. Good job. That's how we do it. Let's do it again. Slower though. Wonderful. Oh, you did it! Did you did you think you could do it? No. No. Did you do it? Yes. Wonderful words. Ah. You want to say that, huh? Let's do it together. Wonderful. Wonderful. Beautiful. Do it again. 
Wonderful. Oh, you stayed with me. We're saying wonderful. Wonderful. My turn. Wonderful. Wonderful. Good job. Wonderful. Wonderful. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Good job. Oh, oh, oh. Wonderful. Wonderful. Get lips around. Wonderful. Wonderful. Keep in mind, there are many different approaches and techniques which are appropriate for children with childhood apraxia. You have seen only a few. A key element of any therapy, though, is to be sure the child gets lots of practice and that visual and touch cues, as well as gestures that may be necessary at first, are faded out as quickly as possible. Finally, it is important that parents understand what is happening in therapy and how they can help their child at home. In that last segment, you saw him succeed at something that I thought was way too hard for him. Every now and then, I really like to let the children decide on a stimulus item, something they really want to say, even if we take a whole session to work on it, to get it accurate, knowing that they will need lots more practice before habituating it and able, being able to, to really generalize it. It did so much to improve his motivation, his self-worth. Uh, he was so happy that he could go back to school after they practiced at home quite a bit <laughs> and say wonderful words just like everyone else in his class. Now that we've looked at some video samples of DTTC, I want to talk a little bit about another example of an articulatory approach to treating childhood apraxia that was also based somewhat on integral stimulation. And this is called REST, or Rapid Syllable Transition. This is another one of the therapy techniques that has shown to be effective, um, has been shown to be effective uh, through studies that have been published. It incorporates theories of motor control and learning and incorporates principles of motor learning. The goal in REST is to maximize the long-term maintenance and generalization of treated speech skills. It involves intensive practice in producing multisyllabic pseudo-words, such as tubiger, to improve accuracy of speech sounds and the prosodic or melodic part of therapy by changing those up, tubiger, tubiger, etc. It involves practice of transitioning rapidly and fluently from one sound syllable to the next and practice in the control of melody in the form of relative emphasis or stress placed on different syllables within the word. It involves two main components within each treatment session. Pre-practice or training where the stimuli are taught with different cueing techniques to shape accurate production and immediate specific feedback is given after each production. In the second part of the session, they do a longer practice component incorporating principles of motor learning that have been shown to facilitate long-term learning or retention and generalization of the motor speech skill. Um, they start with knowledge of results and go to timing, I'm sorry, knowledge of results versus performance in this, in this part of the therapy um, and fading of cues. Efficacy data has been published, as I said, for REST, and those references are in your handout. And I've also included in your handout a wonderful website, which has complete information and many, many video examples of the application of REST. <clears throat> Moving from articulatory approaches to prosodic approaches, examples of methods that utilize prosody, stress, as a primary cueing strategy would be um, melodic intonation therapy. This was originally proposed as a treatment method for acquired apraxia of speech in adults, but has also been proposed for use with children who have CAS. In the adaptation for children, stimuli progress from simple two and three word phrases to more grammatically and phonetically complex utterances. When the method is used for children, uh, they suggest the use of symbols of sign English as a method of keeping time in contrast to tapping out the rhythm like one would do for adults. We won't go into this method in any detail today, but you do have those references. 
Another thing that we do that's a prosodic uh, method, and this is usually with older children, especially that are having trouble with lexical stress, is to do contrastive stress activities. Uh, this does a couple of things. It can be used to facilitate that variability of practice that we talked about earlier today. That is, when utterances are accurate, practice them with different focal inflection, changing rate or volume. Or you can work more specifically on lexical stress by doing things like showing the child a picture of a boy hitting a ball and saying, this is a picture that shows Bob hit the ball. And then you could ask the question, who hit the ball? And the child would have to say, Bob hit the ball. So this is more phrasal stress. Did Bob kick the ball? No, Bob hit the ball. Did Bob hit the truck? No, Bob hit the ball, where they would change the stressed word in the phrase to give the exact meaning. You can also work on the syllable stress within a word. <clears throat> Sometimes we can mark this by just using gestures or arm or body movements. For example, with older kids as they're trying to learn more multisyllabic words such as telephone, you can use these gestural movements. I like them even for the younger kids where we can work on prosody by using um, writing, longer lines, or the, the movement gestures with the arms are actually easier where you go like baby. We know that syllable stress or, or lexical stress is really signaled by changing the length of the vowel, the pitch goes a little higher, and the intensity goes a little higher. In my clinical experience, the easiest and more visible uh, parameter to show them and to cue is length. And if we get them to increase length, they will often increase intensity and pitch on their own, even though we're modeling it too. So I might go, baby, or bunny, really contrasting the length and the volume uh, until you can make it more natural. Sometimes we trace the prosodic pattern. For older children that are learning more multisyllabic words, and this often happens with kids that have a history of apraxia of speech or are still having difficulty with producing multisyllabic words, where as they get into the fourth and fifth and sixth grade where they're learning states and capitals and social studies, they're learning names of different countries. And they're also, like in science, learning um, different longer words that, like isometric, <laughs> that they've never had to say before. It can be helpful uh, to actually type out the syllable structure, like you see on this slide, bolding the stressed syllable. I like to teach the kids that are older how to help themselves learn new words. They won't necessarily have to be in speech therapy as for as long as they might have to be able to cue themselves to say these multisyllabic words. So teaching them how to separate the word into syllables, how to listen for and identify the stressed syllable, and then actually practice this on their own over and over a few times until it becomes more automatic can be a great tool for these kids to learn to do on their own. Of course, I always work with the parents so that they know exactly what's going on. So if the child needs a little help as he gets into more difficult words, uh, they'll be able to do that. Tactile and gestural approaches. The most uh, well-known one would be prompt or prompts for restructuring oral muscular phonetic targets. This is a method devised for use with children with childhood apraxia of speech, and I've given you some references. It's appropriate for childhood apraxia because it implements a motor approach to treatment and emphasizes the movement pattern, utilizing gestural and tactile cues to help move those articulators into very particular positions. The cues involve very specific placement of the hands and fingers to cue both, pl both place and manner uh, of articulatory positions and are produced serially in order to guide sequential events for the syllable and words. Feedback then is primarily tactile and kinesthetic. So what's the current evidence for the best, if you will, or the most efficacious treatments in childhood apraxia? 
There was a systematic review done by ASHA, um, but it's getting to be uh, a number of years old now. Um, and a newer one, and, but that one can be found on the ASHA website by going to the um, position statement on childhood apraxy of speech and then the technical report on childhood apraxy of speech. So you go into the ASHA website, just put that in the search engine and these will come up. Um, they reviewed the entire literature at the time and looked at the evidence for treatment efficacy. Much more recently, Elizabeth Murray and her colleagues and mentors, uh, Tricia McCabe and Carrie Ballard, published a great paper, which is a systematic review looking uh, at tr treatment outcomes for children with childhood apraxia of speech. They searched peer-reviewed treatment articles from 1970 to 2012, and they looked at all levels of evidence. Now, the Cochrane database is the one we know the best for looking at treatment efficacy. The trouble in speech pathology is that that database really looks at the best levels of evidence, which are randomized treatment control studies. And we don't really have those yet, or very few of those kinds of studies. So we don't, they, they can't say much about treatment efficacy in speech pathology. But there are other levels of evidence uh, that provide at least some evidence for the efficacy, probably not the efficiency, but the efficacy of treatment. So they looked at all levels of evidence for articles that actually published communication outcomes for children with CAS, and they compared treatment and generalization evidence. They found 42 articles that represented phase one and two single case experimental designs. Um, they um, or single subject design, they found 23 that were single case experimental designs. So these would be like multiple baseline designs across uh, different, uh, could be across different words and then repeated across children or whatever. They found 19 case series or more case description studies. And then um, uh, within those single subject design, they found 13 different approaches that were used to treat. Uh, childhood apraxia. Uh, six of them focused on motor skills, five of them on linguistic skills, and two of them on augmentative communication. They concluded that two treatments that focused particularly on motor skill, DTTC and REST, uh, and one linguistic treatment, integrated phonologic awareness, seemed best suited for clinical use given their efficacy data. They did make the point that in each of these studies, if it showed efficacy, sessions were at least twice a week and had a dose above 60 trials per session. DTTC appeared to work well for clients with more severe CAS, which one would expect given that that's who they were designed for. And REST appeared to work well for children, say, 7 to 10 years of age with mild to moderate CAS. And I think in, in, as I read the article and have studied REST, it seems to me that REST would also be a terrific uh, program to go to. Um, even for a child with very severe uh, CAS, you may want to start with DTTC, get the child more accurate, and then move to REST where you do more pseudo words and you're playing more with the stress patterns and trying to get more naturalness. Um, the clinician would want to make a decision whether to do REST with the pseudo words, but also maybe use a REST approach using some of the stimuli uh, they've already practiced with DTTC, only maybe put in more uh, in longer sentences. Um, I don't know that the um, terrific clinical researchers who made up REST uh, have ever done that, but um, as I think about how to utilize everybody's ideas in therapy, it, it seems to me that that might be uh, an appropriate thing to do. I have not personally used integrative phonologic awareness only because in my practice I tend to be referred children who have more severe apraxia of speech and very little language at that point where DTTC is more appropriate. Um, but integrated phonologic awareness intervention was shown to work quite well for children four to seven years of age with, with CAS but also who had language impairment and, we need, and who needed to have that language work uh, brought in. So you do have uh, these references. So I know you've been watching at home, hopefully in your jammies with a nice cup of tea, but I'll bet you're really happy to see this slide that says conclusions. It must be hard to sit and listen to one person talk for quite a while like this. 
I think you already knew before I ever started talking that treatment for CAS is hard. What we do in general is hard, but CAS is particularly hard, partly because we don't get a lot of training in this in our clinical training programs, do we? I mean, we don't really practice listening for vowel distortions. We don't really get a lot of practice listening for different kinds of prosodic errors. We certainly don't get a lot of lecture time in terms of different treatment techniques for childhood apraxia for the most part. So if you're out there feeling like, I'm just not sure, that seems perfectly normal to me that you would feel that way. I'm hoping that this video helped you feel a little more confident in your understanding of what CAS is, how to explain that to parents, how to make all those important clinical decisions that make you a clinician rather than a technician. We really have to know a lot. We have to be aware of the motor processing involved in speech production, the way in which those motor processes interact with language. We have to be knowledgeable about the principles of motor learning, how to apply those principles, because all of that is integral to treatment planning. I want to give you a fur, uh, just a few treatment pearls for Monday morning, at least for those few kids you might have with childhood apraxia. Remember, if you do nothing else, increase those number of practice trials per session, and you'll see more efficiency in your treatment. You might want to go back, though, and think about, review, if you will, your choice and the decisions you made about the number of stimuli you're using and why, given what we talked about today. You might want to take the advice of those that write about principles of motor learning to increase that child's attention and effort toward improving movement. You might be thinking more concretely about how and when you're adding and fading cues. There are just a couple of do's and don'ts that I hope you took away from this video. The do's would be maximize responses per session, and the don't would be, well, don't use games and pictures that take a lot of attention away from your face and also take away opportunity for repeated practice trials. Do practice the movement gesture for the syllables as a whole with no interruption in a continuous movement. And don't separate phonemes within a syllable, such as ba, oi, for all the reasons that we talked about. Remember these most important points to take away. Remember that CAS is just a label for a subset of children with a speech sound disorder. Help parents understand that, always telling them, and we know how to treat it. Remember that the focus of treatment is the movement versus the sound, and that changes everything about all those decisions we have to make while planning treatment and during the implementation of treatment. Remember that we'll create very specific stimuli based on vowel content and syllable shape, especially during early treatment and with more severe children. We're gonna maximize response trials per session using quick reinforcers, and we're going to incorporate those principles of motor learning. Finally, and we won't be talking about how to do this today, but I'm going to suggest that you don't take treatment data. Instead, sample maybe five to 10 repetitions of each of your trained stimuli, the ones you're currently working on, in a random way, in direct imitation, every other session, for example, you would choose depending on how often you see the child in order to measure progress. You're gonna be way too busy working with that child, working to shape and make more accurate the movement and won't really have time to take treatment data. And for sure, make sure you have a rationale for every decision that you make as you plan and implement treatment and be confident in your ability to explain that decision to your colleagues, to your students, and especially to those parents. Thank you so much for paying attention to this video. We hope that some of you will be interested in coming to our on-site advanced course. We will get a lot of practice in implementing many of the things that we talked about today, all very important to doing what we chose to do in our profession, which is to help these children learn to verbally communicate. Thank you.